Okay, and this one I want to discuss sexual energy, addiction, masturbation, relationships, and sort of relate that to the reality of the situation that we are in as it relates to how our consciousness is interacting with reality itself and the other consciousnesses that we come into contact with in that way. I've had many addictions in my life for certain periods of time. But they were never things that I wasn't able to overcome if I put my mind to no longer doing them. This is mostly relating to chemicals, which I'm sure all of you have experience with as well. When I was younger, I was a big drinker, but our generation shifted from moderately having a few drinks every now and then to binge drinking a lot at once. So you're not technically what would be described as an alcoholic when you're younger and partying like this because... You do it, say, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and maybe even Sunday, but then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you take a break. And you're kind of in that cycle for a few years when you're younger in college or at a university in America. Obviously, there are a lot of responsible students who go to those higher institutions and spend their time in the library and studying and they're not partying, but if you find yourself in that lifestyle, it quickly becomes that kind of cycle. And people who were partiers like that when they're younger then tend to carry that sort of cycle with them into their careers or whatever they choose to do when they're finished with school, and they become what are referred to as weekend warriors. All business during the week, and then it's a party on the weekends. And they go through that cycle over and over again. And as a result, they tend to develop a relationship, if they develop one, with someone who has a similar cycle. And in that way, you enable each other. A lot of the people that I grew up with ended up marrying someone that was very similar to them in that way because I grew up and hung out with a, a lot of people who wanted to party. And when you first meet their spouse, whatever it is, guy or girl, you think, oh man, he or she is cool. Uh, when you're in the mindset of the partier, <laughs> but then you look back on it in hindsight and you see, oh wow, they really enable each other's lifestyle. In that way, I wonder what would happen if one of them just decided I don't want to drink anymore. And that's a whole thing that would depend on so many different factors. A lot of people meet each other in that way and they were just destined to meet and they're going to support their partner no matter what happens, no matter what choice they make. But still, that doesn't mean it would be easy or there wouldn't be some kind of huge adjustment that they would have to make. Anyways, as soon as I made the decision, okay, I don't want to drink anymore. Yes, it was difficult in the beginning because your body is craving that sugar and you have those withdrawals from the constant stream of sugar that alcohol gives you. But eventually, you don't even miss it anymore, especially the hangovers as you get older. I was addicted in that way to marijuana at various points in my life as well. Um... Smoking every day at certain points in my life, like it was no big deal. There's a lot of people like that now, especially since it's been made legal in a lot of different places. And again, there's nuance to that issue as there is to everything that I'm going to say here. So please don't try to pin me down to some rule that I'm relaying to you if I bring something up and say it in a certain way. There are always exceptions. There is always nuance to everything. So much of how these uh, substances affect you depends on your genetic predisposition, your genetic structure, and your personality, how it was shaped from a young age, what you believe along those lines. There's so many factors that go into it. I say that because I know a person who 
was diagnosed with ADHD when he was younger, and they tried to put him on all of the drugs that you get put on, the pills. But when he got to high school and marijuana became a realistic option. Now, granted, when I was in high school, we didn't really know what we know about it now and all the different ways that you can get the cannabinoids into the body without the THC and everything along those lines. Back in the day, it was kind of like, hey, you either smoke it and get the effects or you don't at all. But he discovered smoking marijuana around that time and figured out that it really helped his attention deficit disorder. It had a positive effect on him. Now, it also had a bunch of drawbacks, of course, because nothing is a miracle in that way when it comes to an addictive substance. Yes, I know it's a plant, but still, it's very addictive in how it can be abused if you smoke too much of it. And there are all kinds of studies coming out about that, especially as the strains have been modified with uh, people who smoke excessive amounts of marijuana developing psychosis and all kinds of other problems. But like my friend, it can also be used for pain management in a way that would be much better for the body than taking a bunch of pills that destroy your liver and uh, all kinds of other systems and give you side effects that are very detrimental to the body. So again, this is not some kind of rule I'm trying to force you to adhere to in your mind, like, oh, marijuana equals bad. <laughs> That's not what I'm trying to say. Uh, there are even people who have suggested that uh, you can extract the oils from it to heal certain ailments. You can juice the leaves to have a powerful antidote to a lot of inflammation and free radicals in the body. It has all kinds of uses along those lines. As these things tend to go, actually smoking the buds is probably the worst way you can utilize the plant, but it's the most fun because it gets you high, quote-unquote. And like many people, I became addicted to that high. It was fun to smoke and do all kinds of different things or just sit around and play video games. It was a blast, you know. And then when you're done with that, uh, food tastes better. Everything's a little better, at least in the moment you think. Uh, you're creative. Uh, but then, like alcohol, you come crashing down from that space just in a less harsh way with uh, marijuana. Uh, and then immediately you're ready to do it again. I was chasing that high. And that's every drug. You chase the high and then you need more of it and more of it and more of it to get the same high that you originally got the first time you smoked it or the first time you drank. There was a period in my life when I was into athletics where I was addicted to chewing tobacco or dip as we referred to it back then. The nicotine buzz you get from dip is intense. <laughs> and anybody who has drank some alcohol and then had a dip can tell you uh, that you will very soon thereafter start spinning if it's the first time that you've ever done that and get very dizzy. Because for whatever reason, the alcohol heightens the effect of it. That's why so many people like to drink and smoke cigarettes. The two chemical effects of nicotine and alcohol are very complementary. But anyway, I became addicted to chewing tobacco to study as well because it, it helps you focus and you can just sit there for a long time and have a heightened alertness when you're reading something if you have a dip in your mouth. But when I decided, okay, I'm seeing some things about what this can do to your mouth, probably not the best idea to continue doing this, I need to quit. Uh, once I put my mind to it in that way, it was easy. But there were certain side effects that were more difficult to get over. Like for me and dip, uh, a lot of people have the same effect when they try to quit caffeine in the form of coffee. Uh, your digestive system is really impacted by the nicotine or the coffee. And you're used to it inducing bowel movements in a certain way. And then you become constipated when you stop for a little while until your body regulates itself. And that's a miserable side effect, of course. But I had similar issues when I quit caffeine as well. Uh, I used to drink uh, a ton of coffee every day. And that was kind of related to being a professional student for a long time. <laughs> you just kind of get into that habit of drinking coffee and studying. 
to keep yourself alert for the 12 hours a day you have to read when you get up to higher levels. But after sucking it up for a little bit, dealing with the effects and avoiding the triggers that made you go right back to it, eventually you learn to trust yourself and your mind in the decision that you made and you uh, will yourself to not go back to the addiction. Now, why am I talking about all of these things I was addicted to? Well, the number one thing that I've been addicted to as a male in this world my entire life is ejaculation, masturbating. I don't even remember how old I was when I first figured it out, but it was, you know, the same age every guy figures it out when you're like 12 years old or whenever puberty hits you in that way. And from that point on, it's been something that was reinforced in society in every way that something can be reinforced. Hey, this is normal. All of the comedies produced by Hollywood reinforce this type of behavior to constantly be thinking about sex, be thinking about ejaculating, uh, whether it's on your own or finding someone else to do it with. Constant reinforcement of that. Now later, you figure out when you become aware of these kinds of things and you start to have the ability to see, <laughs> you figure out, oh wow, this is being subliminally programmed into my mind via media. This is being subliminally programmed into my mind via music. Disney movies, when I was a kid, were subtly programming my mind with this idea of seeking sex all of the time. And everything that is associated with sex. As I've said before, in other places, this is a difficult thing to navigate because within this world... Of course, sex is the way that the species perpetuates itself. So on the one hand, you have this thing that is necessary for the human race to survive. And simultaneously, you have what it has been turned into by this sick society that is in no way healthy. And it's kind of impossible to square those two things together and have them exist simultaneously. But as far as addictions go, I've never been more addicted to something than that. It's never been harder to stop something than to stop that. And I have tried. I have made it my intention to not ejaculate, to save my seed in that way, to avoid pornography, to avoid women in that way, <laughs> to not think about them in that way. I have done experiments like that many times over the years, and I've done it for long periods of time. Like six months, I did it one time. And yet, the addiction always comes back in some way, shape, or form. And that's kind of what I want to get into here, is how I relapsed into that addiction due to what happened to me with my health crisis, but... I want to focus on how my mind used that as an excuse to do something that I knew was not beneficial for me. In other words, I found the justification for it in a way that made sense and I couldn't argue with too much, so I let myself go. I let myself back into the addiction. And I'll explain what I mean so it makes sense, but that's the summary of it. So as a part of my health issues, my neurological collapse, the nerves in my penis were affected the same as the rest of my body. It was a system-wide collapse. And eventually when I started physical therapy, I told my doctor whenever I would see him about my progress and what they were having me do. And eventually I told him about what was going on with my genitals and how, yeah, my nerves are really sensitive there and I'm having all of these issues. And he said, well, it's like physical therapy with the rest of your body. You need to exercise that area. You need to get it uh, learning how to work again. You have to get those uh, neurons in the nervous system learning how to communicate again because they're rebuilding. 
essentially the doctor told me to masturbate, <laughs> right? And at, at that point, I'm like, okay, I have doctor's orders to do this. And even though I've spent so much time attempting to tame this, what feels like a parasite in my mind, constantly saying, seek sex, seek ejaculation. Yes, you need to do this. Do it, do it, do it, do it. <laughs> you know, you as a man, you have that constantly running in your mind. It's a perpetual script that's going. And again, maybe part of that is the reproductive urge to continue the existence of the species. But the way it's functioning in all our minds feels very unhealthy. And I think we all know that deep down, especially as it relates to pornography and that addiction and how unhealthy it is to view hedonistic sex with no other connection taking place over and over again. Viewing the act in that way is just devastating to what it is supposed to be, if it's supposed to be anything, right? If it's supposed to be something, it would be between two people who have an undeniable connection with each other and that connection creates an atmosphere where a child should be brought into the world. That would be the ideal way it would be, I think. I mean, I can't speak for that which created us, but it seems like that on its face. That seems obvious. That's how it would be. But again, because of the mind control that's going on here, that kind of thing is very difficult to find because people are so perverted by everything that has been put into their minds as it relates to that act and just the sexual energy, reproductive energy in general. Long story short, on doctor's orders, I start <laughs> masturbating again way more regularly than I had been in the past. I mean, I had sort of tamed the energy down to doing it maybe twice a month. And for me, now again, this is my path. I'm not saying this is what you should do. But for me, that was how I sort of got the addiction under control and maintained a state that was detached from perverted sexuality. But at the same time, I was regulating the energy that can build up so much that you don't even know what to do with it. Now, obviously, I was a novice in that respect, there are many people who discuss semen retention and they take it to another level. But for me, I, I just don't know if that is a viable long-term approach. And that's just the humbling that took place within me because the medical establishment does say that as a male, your prostate health is related to how many times you ejaculate. And the older version of me, before it was humbled, would say, well, yeah, the medical establishment, all it does is lie. They're just telling us that to stop us from realizing what our true creative power would be if we kept all of that energy inside of us, reserving it only for procreation. Society would be completely different. The entire world would change overnight if every male on the planet did that. And I think there's something to that, of course. Imagine how different it would be if males were not constantly ejaculating. <laughs> I mean, I'm not trying to be funny. Think about that. Think about how many ejaculations are taking place on planet Earth every hour, every minute of every day. Like, it's a lot. It's a lot of wasted energy. And it's a lot of perverted wasted energy when the input is pornography that most people are doing that act to. But it's not even pornography, right? It's uh, also using uh, social media to have random hookups with people just to do it, just for the act of it. Because it, quote, feels good, right? But then at the same time, all of those people are complaining about how they can't find a long-term relationship, how hard it is now. They're not connecting the dots in that way. In any event, the older me would have said that. However, I have to be a little more humble about it and think, okay, well, maybe there could be something to 
the prostate health angle because as anyone who has attempted semen retention will tell you, eventually your body will force you to do it in the form of a nocturnal emission or a wet dream when you're sleeping. And that's a whole subject in and of itself, right? Is it your body forcing you to do that because your prostate health demands it or just your general well-being demands it? Or is that something else influencing your mind to force you to release that energy because of what it could do if you held on to it? I mean, I could see it going either way. So I don't want to pretend like I know. I just think at this point it would be naive of me to think that there's absolutely nothing to what the medical literature is saying about prostate health and ejaculation. So I just want to put that disclaimer out there as I'm describing all of this. You always have to be thinking in those kinds of terms just in case you have this massive blind spot about something that could result in your death, <laughs> right? If you're experimenting with alternative health stuff and you have this blind spot, well, it could kill you. That's how this stuff goes. Uh, so anyway, I have these doctor's orders to ejaculate, and clearly uh, a female is out of the question. I'm not just going to try to find someone to do that with if it didn't happen organically on its own in that connection way that I was describing earlier. So it's like, all right, well, I got to take care of this myself, <laughs> and I let myself fall back into my pornography addiction that I had gotten rid of prior to this because I had the justification. Oh, well I have to do this. So I guess I can watch porn again. And I did that for maybe nine months. I would say around there until I finally had that epiphany. Aha moment. Like, Oh my gosh, Look at what you have allowed to happen. Because it's like any other addiction. Uh, it started off innocent enough. And then before I know it, I'm walking around doing other things. And I'm seeing pornographic scenes in my mind that I had watched prior to that. Like, whoa, okay, that can't be good. That these images are burning themselves into my stream of consciousness to the point where my subconscious mind is bringing them into my conscious mind to replay them. And then, of course, you can see how that starts to skew your view of everyone around you. Now I'm looking at women in a completely different way, uh, in the old uh, way that I used to view them when I was younger, as just objects to have sex with. And I think it's like that with any addiction. You know, you quit it for a long time and then you slip up for whatever reason. You have a bad day and you grab a bottle or a joint, whatever it is. Uh, people don't smoke joints anymore, I guess. Whatever you smoke out of now, vapes, the vape pens. And you start doing it again and at first you think, oh man, I can't believe I stopped doing this. It's fun. But then even quicker you have the realization, oh wow, now I remember why I stopped doing this. Because then you have the negative effects really amplified for you. And it was the same way with me in porn, where I realized just how impactful it is on how you view the world. And how pent up you get with this sexual energy that you're just unable to control. It takes you over. And I'm going to sound like some kind of pornography hipster here, but it's not like I was viewing mainstream pornography, the truly evil stuff where it's the famous pornography actors that everybody knows. I, I would never watch anything like that. Uh, but even the quote unquote amateur stuff that's like real people, allegedly, I mean, even that is faked to a certain degree to where it's very difficult to find something that's not seriously offensive <laughs> that uh, can facilitate that type of thing. The goal of the whole thing, I mean. Even those scenes were replaying in my mind and shifting my perception of reality in a very negative way. My point is, 
Yes, there is degeneracy everywhere. Society has been completely degenerated when it comes to sex. Um, and this is women and men. I'm giving the male perspective of how we degenerate in our minds as we interact with everyone, which of course includes the media's role in it. But women are playing into it in the same way. Uh, just a simple example how women dress these days. It's completely normal for a woman to walk outside in yoga pants that shows the outline of their genitals. That's considered normal now. <laughs> you know, it's complete insanity. And the feminist mindset has been so programmed into uh, women in this way that they would view that as empowering somehow. And it's like, no, no, no. That's your version of the male sickness that I'm describing here. <laughs> okay. That's your version of it. An example, anyway. There are many different ways. But I'm getting sidetracked here. Uh, I eventually realized everything about the addiction that made me get rid of it in the first place. And before going further, I guess a part of what I wanted to discuss here as it related to addictions is... Even if it seems like somebody has everything together, no, we're all constantly fighting with these things that are in our mind, these cycles that are constantly trying to reassert themselves, which lead to self-sabotage. Because the self-sabotage energy is how everything functions in this world. That's how everything is propagated. That's the elemental truth of it. Because yes, there is all the external things that influence us up to and including the very thoughts in our own head by that which is in control here. But if you take control of that, or at least you get it under control in some way, the influence can't do anything to you anymore. So if everyone was doing that, this goes back to what I was discussing regarding sexual energy and what would happen if everyone held on to it, in spite of the influence, well, the world would completely change almost overnight. Everything would be different. And the influence on us would have a very difficult time maintaining its control. Because it needs us to self-sabotage. It needs us to do these things to ourselves. To consciously make the decision, even though you know it's something you shouldn't do, to seek the pleasure instead of what you know is the right thing to do. I mean, it all goes back to the original choice in the Garden of Eden. That's what it was. That was the ultimate self-sabotage. Yes, there was the influence. Yes, there was the voice in the head saying, Hey, do this and you will know these things. Do this and you will be able to do this. Do this and you will feel everything you ever wanted to feel that you're unaware of right now. But Adam and Eve didn't have to make that choice. They could have just stayed in the garden chilling. Uh, they were unaware of what they would lose by making those choices. And that's what we do every time we allow an addiction to control us. But luckily... There is always a lesson in these types of things. And I learned a couple new things when I went through this pornography addiction again. Even if I had a justification for it, like, hey, this is for the benefit of the health of my body to repair itself. Regardless of that justification, I didn't need to watch porn to do that, right? I could have used my imagination or whatever. I didn't have to watch porn. I saw the opening, and the old addiction said, yes, let's go. It's a, it's almost like a virus that stays dormant, and then when you're under stress or your immune system is compromised, then it reasserts itself. Uh, I think uh, the chickenpox virus is like that as it relates to shingles. It lies dormant, and then somebody experiences this really stressful situation, or their immune system gets compromised, and then they develop shingles. Because the virus is there, dormant, your body has it under control, uh, but then it's compromised, and boom. There it is, expressing itself. It's kind of similar with all of these addictions of the mind, or at least addictions that the mind has control over, in a way that it doesn't necessarily have control over uh, a pathogen in your body. 
Though, of course, at the highest levels of understanding, you would probably be able to influence those types of things with a proper relationship between your mind and the body. Ideally, it would be one fluid thing. The mind is the body, the body is the mind, and they are in complete congruence in that way. But that's what school in the media does. It separates the mind from the body. It programs you to believe in the mechanistic view of the reality in which we exist, where the mind is separate from the body. Each is a piece in a machine as opposed to a holistic thing that is all interrelated and depending upon all of the parts. Anyways, I'm constantly getting sidetracked here. <laughs> what I learned from this new experience where I finally realized what I was doing and said, oh my gosh, what am I thinking here? And I made the decision to delete uh, the folder that I had all of this porn in. Finally, I realized what a hypocrite I was being, how stupid I was being, what was I doing watching this again, knowing what I know. Why am I self-sabotaging like this? I make the decision, I am deleting this stuff. No more. So I go to the file, uh, throw it into the recycle bin, and empty the recycle bin. And I have this rush of energy come over me like, woo, all right, <laughs> see you later. And you're feeling pretty good about yourself. Like, okay, I'm done. I absolutely have the willpower to never uh, visit the websites. It was this folder that had all of these videos that were so easily accessible, and I know the effect that they have. <laughs> and uh, that was the big problem. But a very interesting thing happened to me in the immediate aftermath of doing that, making that decision. Number one is the very first night after I made that decision, I went to sleep and I had a sex dream. And it had been months since I had any kind of dream like that. It was very typical of the type of dreams that you have when you're retaining and it's like something is in your dream trying to force you to release. And so it, it had that energy to it, this dream that I had, even though I had just recently um, ejaculated, so that shouldn't have been an issue. So it was a very weird dream to have right after that had happened. I had never had that experience before. But it connected a dot for me in the sense of, Okay, maybe there's some relationship here where when you are doing what you're supposed to do or what it wants you to do here, which is constantly ejaculate and watch pornography every other day, three times a week, or if you have a severe problem, like more than once a day, there are people like that out there. When you're doing that, it's like they leave you alone in your dreams. <laughs> it's kind of like, okay, we can just let them be. They're giving us the energy we want. They're in the mindset we want, uh, where they're having this detached view of sexuality and sexual energy, and they're not fully understanding what it is and the power that it has. That's fine. We can leave them alone. But as soon as you make the decision to not do that anymore... That's when those dreams start entering your mind. And again, that could be coincidence. Maybe that's the body trying to force you to release because it's good for it. Like I was discussing earlier, but again, you got to remember this dream that I had was a couple days after the last time that I did that. So it was a very out of place dream. It seemed like retribution for what I had done, <laughs> okay? And then I had a similar dream the next night. And that is very out of place and not the norm with these things. After that, I kind of got a little bit of a handle on it. And then, uh, just a couple days after that, I got two texts from two different ex-girlfriends on the same day. <laughs> and I'm just like, what is happening? I had not had any kind of interaction with either of these girls for a while. I mean, we're talking months. 
And then on the same day, they both decide to contact me. And one of them was just seeing what was up and saying, hey, what's going on, blah, blah, blah. But the other one straight up propositioned me to meet up with her. And I'm like, what is going on? And so I was very curious. Like I asked her, hey, what made you ask me to do that? What is going on in your life right now? Like, what are you feeling here? And, you know, we got into it, which is more information that I'm going to talk about here. But suffice it to say that something out of the ordinary motivated her to contact me in a way where it's like, okay, she was obviously being manipulated to ask me to have sex with her uh, by forces larger than her own mind and what she wanted to do. And so I put all of these things together, all of these random quote unquote coincidences happening in a week of me making that decision to not watch porn anymore. It's like, okay, now I can truly see the agenda here and what's going on. Which is to say, hopefully you can read between the lines a little bit about what I'm describing here and what is truly transpiring with our relationships to other people and how our consciousness is interacting with them in real time based on what we are doing. Our addictions can manifest in so many different ways. I'm describing chemical addictions mostly here, sexual, uh, energetic addictions, but people can have all kinds of different uh, addictions that are flowing from trauma, for example. Maybe somebody has an eating disorder because of some trauma they experience, so they're addicted to punishing themselves in that way, to not eating food for whatever reason. Or they have some kind of abuse going on where they cut themselves because of that addiction. To the pain, that is. They're addicted to the pain because they feel some type of way about themselves. They have some kind of shame related to trauma going on. These addictions can manifest themselves in so many different ways. And you really have to know yourself, know your own thoughts, and understand why you are the way that you are. You really have to do a lot of introspection along these lines to figure out what's going on. And I bring that up to say, yes, I backslid into an addiction that I had conquered, or at least I had tamed. I wouldn't say I ever conquered it. I don't think you can ever conquer the sexual uh, energetic addiction in this place. It's maybe easier for a female in that respect, but like as a male, we are programmed to reproduce, and that is constantly in our head. So it, conquering it would be probably an arrogant way to approach it. Taming it is probably a more humble way to view it, and a better way for long-term success to view it. But even though that happened to me, I'm still going to look at the success that I have had with other addictions. Yes, I backslid into that addiction and I'm not happy about myself for doing that, but I'm also not going to abuse myself or get down on myself just because that happened. Because I look at all of the other addictions that I've tamed in a similar way and I didn't backslide on those. So you got to take the good with the bad, not be too harsh on yourself and just continue the positive upward trend. Even if you take a little slight dip back down, (laughs) you can still get right back on the track upwards. I don't know why we always associate up with good and down with bad, but it is what it is, right? It's probably the religious programming about heaven being up and hell being down. But speaking of religions, a lot of Christians actually talk about backsliding in their faith. They will say, yes, I was renewed in my faith. I was really doing great. And then something happened where I backslid and I just lost faith a little bit. And I was doing all these things that I had stopped doing. And I just found myself in this place that I never thought I would find myself in again. And Of course, that applies to this as well. We all have faith in some things to varying degrees, and events happen in our lives where that faith is challenged. And maybe there's a period of time where we go through and we say, I don't believe any of that stuff anymore that I used to believe. What was I thinking? And then hopefully you can see how the New Age propaganda that I'm talking about all the time plays into this because it's an addiction. It's an addiction to bliss. You 
create these ideas in your mind, you assimilate them, that bypasses all of the real things that are happening in your life and the world. <laughs> you don't pay attention to any of that. You are addicted to the thoughts that make you feel blissful and like everything's fine. <laughs> and that's very detrimental to actually discovering what is truly going on in your mind. So anyway, I just wanted to put this out there, especially for those of you who are newer to all of this, because from your perspective, you might think that I have everything put together based on the YouTube videos that I make from time to time. And it's like, no, man, I don't have anything put together. I'm just like everybody else trying to figure this stuff out on a daily basis. And I have hard times, too, that make me deviate from my intent in that way. And all you can do is pick yourself up the next day and be like, all right, that happened, but I'm going to get back to it and get back on track, and hopefully I'll go longer the next time than I did this time. Whatever it is you're referring to, whatever you're trying to stop or whatever you're trying to achieve in your life, I'm starting to feel like I'm getting into David Goggins' territory, so I should just splice a video of him in here <laughs> berating you for uh, feel, being soft in a given moment. <laughs> uh, but I'll spare you guys from that and any more rambling and just say that's enough for now. Later.